yesterday there is a brother who came here he is uh, he, uh, he's from Cameroon also he was going around in a, a Walmart he was uh, distributing his uh, business business uh, flyers so I was coming out from Walmart and he put one of the flyer in the window of my car so I saw him and I say hey can I help you he said no uh, he has a business of cleaning I said okay uh, what you do as cleaning so I look at the flyer and I told him you know how do you work what you do whatever and uh, he said he was I, I told him I was not long it was far away from from uh, thank you from Walmart so we drove together for him to come see the house to see how much we charge to clean so we arrived around what i believe four or three something so when we arrived i showed him i told him okay i want to have the carpet clean the stair who has the home i mean the upstairs clean which were really the one that need cleaning and then round just dust off stuff like that so we're discussing and he told me what about the basement i said no the basement is fine uh, it's just a sanctuary he said sanctuary so he said ow oh. so we came downstairs and when we came in he started screaming like oh you are a pastor yeah. I was like, yeah. He was like, oh, this is so full. This is amazing. He, he, he was he was all over. And then we sat, we stood over here from four until nine. He came just to see the cleaning. To tell me how much he gonna charge and it turned into a, <laughs> a conversation he had 1,000 questions to ask and one after the other were as if I don't know but it's as if he saw Jesus and he wanted to he is, he is a believer he has been uh saved at least for 30 years he attends church he's actually a baptist uh, uh, a baptist christian so he started asking concerning he said well when he goes around with his sister he sees how oh, the pentecostal he says he's laughing at them that this is a foolishness that there is no such as tongues there is no such as the holy ghost there is no such as the gifts so we started there and after he said but where is he in the bible is he written that a man cannot be polygam where is it he he has one thousand questions he went one after the other but something as the lord was answering and by the grace of God, some of the verses that I read way back then came back to my mind. <laughs> because it was not the time to take your phone. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's the time to take your Bible. So by the grace of God, we were able to go through the word of God. And he was surprised to read in the same word that he has always read for 30 years. To read the same verse he has always read. How oh, he was reading at the same verse with a different lens. And I said, no. Read again. Read over here. And he was, he was shattered. He said, how come that for 30 years the Baptist church did not tell us the truth? I say it's not the matter of that do not tell her the truth you have the word you look at the word and so we start talking and then we start talking and 
we went finally into the baptism. He have explained on how they baptize him. And they see in the Baptist church, they baptize you three times. So one in the name of the Father, another one of the Son, and another one of the Holy Spirit. So we went also through the Bible concerning this. And he was amazed. And finally, I said from three to nine, just to come to look at the stairs to make the cleaning thing. And finally, he asks a question. He said, but since God does not allow polygamy, if a man is a sinner, he has three wives and 15 children. And now he becomes Christian. Shall he do what with his wives? I was like, <laughs> I said, this one is a very important question because the guy did not know the Lord. You see what I'm saying? And he has wives. He married all of them. He actually told me that uh, he's from he's a Bantu, that from Cameroon, right? And that over there they believe in having many wives. Yeah. So that's what he told me. And he actually he said that he has also been in Morocco for 20 years. And he has been in Ivory Coast also and in Senegal. So he has been around. So you start telling that, would you tell to that man who did not know the Lord to do what? To send away all his wives? And I told him, I said, listen. Now, I, I want to really speak on this one because that that last question really, like, I never I never had that question before. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that was a real situation. And I said, I will tell him the word of God. The word of God says, one husband, one wife. He said, no. What would you tell him? I said, but I will tell him the word of God. I was trying to bail out. You see what I'm saying? Because I don't put in my mouth that I will tell him, divorce your wives. <laughs> because I, I said, I will tell him, follow the word of God. The word of God says one wife, one husband. And he says, but no. He said, what you, he come to your church, what you will tell him, that he has to leave the other wives. I said, listen. I cannot tell it. The word of God tells it. He refused it. He said, you as a pastor, he comes to you to ask you. What will you say? I, I heard what he was saying. <laughs> How, like uh, Solomon, will you settle the case? They came to Solomon. This is my child. This is my child. He knew God. He knew the word. I mean, the law. But they asked him, what would you say concerning this case? What you say? <laughs> exactly. Uh, why would you, because you listen to it? <laughs> okay. So I told him, first and foremost, Noah, was Abraham, I said was Abraham, was before Abraham, right? Noah did not have two wives. He had only one. His children also had one. And all of them made eight, right? So I told him that if we go all the way back, it started with Adam and Eve, it was one wife, one husband. With Noah, it was one wife, one husband. 
But when Abraham tried to have a, what can we call it? A shortcut. Sarah told him, no, this finally leave that wife, let her go. And he told me, he said, but it was Sarah's fault. <laughs> she was the one who told you, a husband, go take my servant. And I said, hmm, you're right. <laughs> he said, but Sarah, I said, but he said, Agar was chased away. And the child was chased away. And Abraham was suffering. So he suffered his, for his loss of his child. Sarah was suffering. Uh, 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 Agar was suffering for being chased away. And he said, what did Sarah, what did Sarah suffer? <laughs> oh, 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 hey. I said, I said, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And then we came back to the question of the three wives. And he, as we were discussing, he told me something. He said, I, I told him at that point, when, when Abraham went to the Lord, because he was not happy about what Sarah said. He, he really believed that Sarah was wrong. And he went to complain to the Lord. And the Lord said, ah, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm backing up Sarah. So after I told him that, I said, listen. In that case, that person who came to the Lord will need to pray and to ask to the Lord. Which one? <laughs> of the three you're supposed to have. And the two others, he will be responsible for taking care of them and the children. Such like, a, what's his name? Uh, David. When David came back from the exile, he did not go anymore to his wives and concubines, but he took care of them. Hallelujah. But that question resonated in my spirit throughout the night. And he said, but David had many wives. The Lord did not ban him. Actually, the Lord told him that you were my chosen and my, uh, how is it that? My preferred one. Hallelujah. And then I say, but the many wives that David had was not the will of God. It was a curse that was given to the kings because of how they wanted to have a king and the Lord said that your king will come he will take your children he will take your daughters he was a part of the curse not of the will of God hallelujah so finally we went into the from the Old Testament to the New Testament and it was clearly written that let everyone and the husband have his own wife and the wife has her own husband so we agreed that indeed the word of God has elucidated and clarified it. However, the question remained in my mind to how do we apply the word of God in case of sin, conflicts, and distracts. And I realize what the word of God tells us and reminds us, it says, Speak truth in, in what? In love. You see, rebuke with meekness. Hallelujah. And I realize that if 
I see an homosexual, first and foremost, the that sin itself angers me. You know what I'm saying? So the guy asks me, he said, if two homosexuals come to sit down over here, what would you do? I say, the church is open for everybody. He said, but what will you do? How will you view them? On which side of the eye would you look at them? Hallelujah. It is one thing to say, come in. It is another thing to actually receive them. And now the Lord starts speaking to me. He said, He literally loved the sinner. Hallelujah. Like, in, in the term love, it was not a saying, it was a dying. I, I, even I'm saying, he literally loved the sinner. And then he came for grace and truth. So as I was meditating on, like that word, like that question was resonating in my mind, in my mind. I knew that the guy has to, he cannot have three wives. But the two other wives are not the, are not, how should I say that? They are not responsible for, for being married by him. You know what I'm saying? But, so, physically, emotionally, it is a tough situation. It's like, you have a child there, and God says, I bend on this child. Are you know what I'm saying? Abraham, he told him, I bend on your child. And then I realized that we talk about the story, but it's another story when you have to be the one. And then the Lord has reminded me. He said, I do not want let me put it this way I do not want the sinner to be look because he sinned hallelujah but I want you to look at the sinner because I died for him this one like he, he, he just I was like, how oh, so? And then he sent me back in John. When the adulteress was found in adultery, right? What happened? She was brought, not because she committed adultery only, but she was brought because they were looking at the sin of adultery, right? So when they brought her, they literally wanted to stone her because of the of that sin you feel what i'm saying but when the lord came he saw also the sin she did right is look at her but the way he saw her was different on how the people who wanted to apply the law saw her and in fact they were not doing something wrong were they no they were correctly applying the law. But it's how they were applying it that made them wrong. Hallelujah. It's how they were applying it that made them wrong. So the Lord looked at them and to settle the case, he says the famous phrase, if anyone among you is what 
without sin. Now, here's a problem. Being without sin, it means that you don't have hypocrisy in your heart. You know what I'm saying? Being without sin, it means that you look at the sinner with the love of God. You know what I'm saying? Being without sin is that you look at the creation of God with a desire to see that person back to Christ. So, they were all guilty. From, from who? From the, the, the master, from the elder to the, can you imagine? The five years old who were also there, pick up the stone. Because the grandpa picked up the stone. And they were all going to just stone. But that five years old, technically, which sin he has? You know what I'm saying? But the Lord whipped them all and settled the case. So I started now meditating. I said, wow. I said, Lord, I'm guilty. Because I don't like homosexual, honestly. <laughs> like that homosexual thing, <laughs> I, I hate it. So when a guy stand and then you start doing this thing like this already, like when I see it already, I cannot pray for him. Honestly, I, I, I just can't. But certainly if he comes near me, I will pray for him. But when I see him from afar, I will just switch. So the Lord reminded me, ah, you apply the truth. Ah, you see the sinner. Is how that you see the sinner is how that you diffuse both the truth and the grace. And the word, I mean, and the thought came again. And that man we were talking, I realized that he had the same situation because obviously he was talking about his difficulty. He was saying, honestly, why, why, why in the Bible is written that you cannot be polygamous? <laughs> he was struggling. And after that, he was talking about Baptist. And I told him from the book of Acts, chapter 8, on how, no, chapter 18, on how they rebaptized the people of uh, uh, Samaria. And I said, So you say that I was not. Baptized correctly? <laughs> he says, so you're telling me after 30 years, they plowed me three times? I was not baptized? I said, honestly, you took a shower without soap. And then he asked me, he said, but how do you know that the Lord's speaking to you? And then I told him, I say, how do you know that your wife on the phone is speaking to you? Do you see her on the phone? He said, no. I said, but how do you know? He said, because I know his, his voice. I said, that's what the Lord says. He says, my sheep knows my voice. And it's a matter of relationship. The more close you are to Christ, the more established you have that relationship, the more you know God spoke to you. And finally, he stood, he shook his head, and he said, okay, when, 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 when do you guys have church? <laughs> I said, 11.30. 
said, but do you scream when you pray? <laughs> I said, it depends. <laughs> it, it depends. But I can see the brother struggling. Just for one verse in the word of God that he read all the time. But one day, he finally had his eye open. But he was hungry to know what was what. But while I was ministering to him, in turn, the Lord was ministering to me. And that question rotated in my mind. Ah, and what? would you tell to the person who was not eventually the word of God is clear is have only one wife amen is easy <laughs> okay but the situation is not easy you, you know what I'm saying the situation is not easy you're gonna create something that will be troublesome so how do you rightfully apply the word of God? And he tells to Timothy, rightly dividing the word of God. Hallelujah. How to apply it with an eye of Christ and enough love. says verse 1 of chapter 8 of John it says but Jesus went to Mount Olives of Olives early in the morning he came again to the temple all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them the scribes and the pharisee brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst they said to him teacher this woman has been caught in the act of adultery now in the law of moses and in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This is exactly what our brother asked me. Hallelujah. He said, the man had three wives. He was not a believer. But now, he got born again. Now he comes to you. He asks you what he shall do. You see, they did not ask Christ because they know what the Lord say. <laughs> Amen. It's not Jesus. What are you saying concerning the law? Is you what is your belief or what your opinion? Like, how do you interpret that? Like. We, we call it a judge is a ruler of the law. He did not write the law, but is the one who rules over what is written. And oftentimes, on how he understands the law, he can give a wrong judgment. Or he can give a right judgment, but too harsh. So they asked him, they said, Lord, what do you say? Verse 5, now in the law, 
Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? And the Bible said, this they say to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Are you going to apply the word of God? Or are, are you going to not apply the word of God? <clears throat> but you see, on how you apply the word of God, you're going to be guilty of it. Can you imagine that? If he did not also apply the word of God, he will be also guilty. Both ways. And then, as and as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and rolled on the ground. But when they heard it, <laughs> oh Lord Jesus, they came to him and they said, this is the situation. Amen. This is what the law says. Before God, you are a representative of the word of God. You are the synagogue teachings. So what do you say concerning the law that has preceded you? He bends down. Hallelujah. And then he gets up. He does not address the law, but he addresses the love of God. And by addressing the love of God, he demonstrates the power of the love of God that can break sin and not the law of God that will break sin. That, that, does it make sense? <sighs> and then he bends down again. Verse 9. But when they heard it, they went away <laughs> one by one. Beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Now this is where the word struck me in the car. He says, Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Now here's a question. Was she guilty of or adultery? Was she also rightfully, because righteousness is to apply the measure of the word or the law. That's right. So was she rightfully to be stoned? Yes. But the Lord will now tell her, woman, where a day has no one condemned you verse 11 she said no one Lord if you notice if you notice is that she literally felt not that they passed over a sin amen but she felt that she has been 
forgiven. You, you know what I'm saying? The sin she committed was not looked over. By the way Christ addressed it, she felt I was forgiven. I'm certain she had her head down. Uh, I mean, I'm certain, I uh, assume. Where are the one who condemned you? And she said, no one. But this is where it strikes me. It says, and Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Now, in the word condemn, let me, in the word condemn, he also speaks of holding. That's what I'm saying. Condemning is let me put it this way. When somebody has killed the child of somebody and the person says, I want justice for my child. When they go to court and the person is condemned, the person is relieved in the fact that he has held that condemnation against the person. Does it make sense? So it becomes relief because that's what he wants. That's the desire. So the holding of the condemnation is the memory of what has been done. And she asks, and he asks her, he says, where are the one who held against you your sin? Hallelujah. And she said, I knew I was condemned by the word, but you have come, come through and you have showed me your love. But this is how you see the love of Christ. The Bible says, and Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. And from now on, what? No, she, he says, and Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go. Amen? Go. And from now on, sin no more. I realize that for him to be able to redeem a soul and a life, he has to demonstrate that he loved her. Hallelujah. It's in that demonstration of love that he was not able to free her from the power of that sin. And herself, by realizing that where she was supposed to be eh, dead, she received a full, complete pardon You know, it kind of like a trigger your mind and your soul to say, ah, I was to be dead. But the application of the love of God in her life testify that she has not been going back again. Amen? She became a disciple. So that question from the brother was going through my mind. How would you apply the word of God concerning the three wives he married before knowing Christ? Imagine a Muslim. Amen? They have the right, according to the what, uh, Quran, to have many wives. So, by doing so, quote and quote, he is not sinning. I say quote and quote because it is according to his law, his book. Before God, he's sinning, 
but in his mind he's not sinning does, does it make sense so when that Muslim comes to the faith what does he do with the three wives huh. hallelujah if you just tell him well you can only have one wife <laughs> He will probably end up having one, but there will be amertume. I will say that. Bitterness in his soul. Hallelujah. But how you will apply the word of truth by leading him to make a righteous like uh, Joseph. The Bible says he had every right, right, to repudiate. Uh, I'm sorry, repu um, repudiate Mary he has every right because he did not know her I, I, at least he knows he did not know her amen <laughs> and then I'm certain he was not drunk men also a drunker to say okay it was when you were drunk I remember the story of her who's his name huh Lord or or or, or Jacob huh huh Noah Noah Jacob was drunk. They brought another wife. <laughs> Amen. And then he wake up and he say, Hey, where is Rachel? <laughs> he was drunk. But this guy, who is his name? Joseph was not drunk. He was not a drunker. So he knows this baby is not from him. And the Bible says, being a righteous men he did not want to repudiate her what publicly uh, publicly and he settled to repudiate her in secret and the Lord came through in the dream and helped Joseph settle his case. Hallelujah. How do we apply the word of God? Like the lens with what we look at. How do we see the sinner? Definitely the yesterday, that man, <laughs> he made my brain and my spirit and my soul go round. So for each one of us, the question is, when we love, hallelujah, which, which love do we love? Hallelujah. Amen. For us, the, re the answer will be with the love of Christ. Hallelujah. For us, it is the love of Christ. You can carry some burden that will be over your head. But the love of Christ can hold you and to keep you going. You know, when you read 1 Corinthians 13, let's take together. It says, verse 1, If 
I speak in tongues, sorry, in the tongues of men and of and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic power and understand all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. It says, if I give away all I have, what is giving away? You know, you cannot love without giving, but you can give without loving. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, hallelujah. In this case here, from verse 1 all the way to the first part of verse 3, is a demonstration of a true disciple who is following Christ, who is staying in the ways of Christ. Hallelujah. But yet, he failed to have done so by love. Hallelujah. And the word of God says, but I have not love, I gain what? Nothing. Verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not what? Arrogant or rude. It does not insist on his own way. It is not irritable or resentful. <laughs> when I lack patience, I sin against love. Amen? Hallelujah. When I lack, when I'm, when I'm arrogant or boasting, I have not love. When I'm rude, I have not love. One time I went to Sam's club and there was a guy standing right before me doing the chicken. And that guy, I came, I wanted the chicken and I said, hello. He was standing right here. I said, hello. He didn't answer me. So I thought I did not speak out correctly so i did it again but this time firmly and loudly hello sir he didn't answer me so i waved my hand i say hello sir he didn't answer me seriously i didn't like it so i went to call for the manager and I said, manager, but is he at Sam's Club? Are people supposed, are, are, your, are the workers, the employee of Sam's Club, are they supposed to greet everyone? That's how I asked the question. He said, well, yeah, but when people come to some club, they already know what they buy. So in Sam's Club, they don't really, you know, have to tell you or to court you in order to buy it because you know what you buy, that's why you go there. I said, hmm. <laughs> that if you go to Nike, that we have to try to convince you, ah, this is the thing, this is the last shoe, this is the thing. If you go to the car dealership, hey, that was even worse. <laughs> Hallelujah. But when you go to some club, nobody has to talk to you. You yourself, you go, you take what you have to take, and you get out. And I said, huh. I said, so does it mean that the people cannot greet 
if they are greeted. He said, no, people should still, you know, be kind. I said, but there is that man over there. He was doing the chicken. I told him hi three times. He did not answer me. But the worst is that he stared at me. <laughs> Roll his eye on me and make it, and then went do it. So I didn't get it. So after I complained to him by saying, you know, I don't get this attitude. As I was driving home, the Lord reminded me of one and two things. The first is that demon will manifest in the presence of Christ. First thing. You know, oftentimes I will say you can go somewhere and people for no reason, you haven't done something, you haven't done nothing. They just don't like you. And then the second thing that he reminded me is pray for those who despitefully use you. And I said, ah, I didn't pray for that guy. <laughs> Amen. I was not happy about his attitude. And quickly I had to repent and pray for him. So he said, love. So I was supposed to love that guy. And the Lord reminded me, there are people who go through things so horrible that their life is dysfunctional. And right there, he could have been an opportunity to change the course of the life. Hallelujah. How do you apply the love of God? Hallelujah. Let's read. Verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or easily irritated. Amen? Or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things Believe all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never hands. Hallelujah. You know, we have uh, known that the Lord has told to us oftentimes that we will be receiving in this church all kind of people. All kind. Drug addict. Demonically possessed. All kind. How are we going to look through the lens of Christ? To make sure that by the power of the love of God and the word of God, they can be set free. Having in our heart the desire to see Christ being the master, being the king. You know, now I'm looking at this one. Abby came here and she wrote here, love, I, I love Jesus.
when we love Christ? How do we apply the truth of Christ? How do we apply the word of God? Are you following me? Amen. Let me ask you this question. <clears throat> How many among you, you, you tell me, okay, is uh, open? How many among you believes that I don't call them often? Or should I say, how many among you believe I should call them sometimes, down to times? <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, a brother told me something on the... I mean, he was doing a video. There was two. One told me the sum and another in the, through the video. The one who told me, he said, as you are ministering, you go from house to house to see your members? I said, no. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, no. I say, we are a little church. Everybody is a grown person. And he said, ah, but you don't go to. I say, Tom, one time, you know, passing by. But no, um, I don't. And then he said, but in this church, how do you deal with each other and I said well when when people come we obviously not a big church <laughs> okay so we know each other personally it's not like in a big church where the pastor is over there he does not know at least 60 percent of the church because he does not you know engage with them at no level I said no by the grace of God we are still in a small church and after church we have a time where we sit down together and then we speak together trying to compensate the week where we do know that everyone is either going to work or going to do so so we have established that principle before we before in the beginning of the church when church was finished everybody goes home but i think within the first uh, the first few years we started having that fellowship where we all sit down together and he became a uh, he became a, a habit hallelujah he became a habit and that's how we finally have the time to speak with each other share with each other and that's how we, we do so and then by the grace of God we have now uh, Wednesday we have now uh, Friday and when uh, you know so we have time when we see each other but if somebody calls i'm i'm always just, like if i have to help i will be available to help me but the question still remain in my mind because when we become that big church and we have 200 people 500 people I don't think we'll be having food every Sunday. Sitting around. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I don't think so. We we'll probably have a kind of a kitchen something where people can take home food, but I don't think we will sit around a table, all 500 of us. At that time, it will become a necessity to get to know all your members so when he asked me that question i start seeing myself into those days 
how are we going to do this? So now here's my thing. I would, I would ask to all of you, to determine where is your house church like determine and then when you make a determination because I know that the Lord will give us the grace of seeing members who will stay hallelujah for a matter of fact last Sunday we were praying for all the members of the church. Remember, is that, is that last Sunday or two thousand Sundays ago? Two Sundays ago. We were praying for the members of the church. And there is one of the members who hasn't come here for at least one year. Or maybe at least. Yeah. Close to one year. And the next week after we pray, she just popped up. <laughs> Hallelujah. And my wife reminded me, she said, we pray about it on a Friday something. And then the week after she's there. This realized that for us as a church, we must double down on prayer. Hallelujah. As a church, we must double down on prayer. That's what I'm talking about to determine your house church. Because... Each one of us should be able to take a responsibility of something. Amen. Each one of us take a responsibility of something. So we are already ready to receive the numbers. Hallelujah. So when they come, it's not now that we're trying to figure out who, 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 <laughs> who going to do what. Hallelujah. So I will ask you to prayerfully determine with the Lord your house church and then determine with the Lord your service in that house. Hallelujah. When the people start flowing, eventually this place will not be sufficient. Amen. My prayer has always been to either buy a land, build a church, or buy a building for the church. So this way we are free from the oppression of the loan. How do we call it? Huh? Landlord. I say that because you know the food. Uh, what did they call it? That food place that left. Garden Coro. Garden Coro, they make a lot of money. And they are a big, huge food place. But the landlord has decided to increase the rent on them. And I was thinking, what type of increase did he do that we even caused them to shut down? Yes, they left. A big place like this. <laughs> the first person, remember when they took you to the, yes. You remember that Golden Corral, right? Yes. A big restaurant such as like this closed down because the one who owns the land decided to increase. So I was thinking he probably went from 10000 to $200,000 because it has to be an increase that is so high that the guy is, is willing to lose all his uh, customers. So I was thinking about it and I say, as a church, if we don't have the grace to establish our land, we might be at the mercy of the government. In many churches, they had to close in a time of COVID, for instance, because the building was not for them. That's what I'm saying. So I'm asking you to join with me in that prayer. 
that the Lord will give us that grace to be able to either purchase a building. I believe God can touch somebody to say, listen, I want you to have this building and then give us either a price or give us to build something so that we have something that we can call our home. Hallelujah. So that's my asking to all of you to join me in that prayer. Our prayer topic is for the church not only to grow, but to have its own domain. Hallelujah. One more time, I believe today that's all the Lord has to say. I've made my plan. I wanted to preach about the word of God that I wanted to preach last Sunday. Last Sunday went uh, uh, <laughs> outside of control. This Sunday, I thought I would preach about that word. I was ready. I put my, my tie. I was like, hey, going to be fired today. But again, the Lord has turned it however he wants. Amen. Hallelujah. But I want you to remember that word, that meditation, love. How do you love? How do you love? Like on which lens do you utilize to love? How do you love? With the lens of Christ, how do you love? Apply the word of God. Apply it with the lens of Christ. Hallelujah. Do yourself as I do myself a favor to not be called among the one who could not say a thing and they all walked out but rather to be like Christ who are able to redeem hallelujah a soul that was uh, condemned to death hallelujah there is power in that type of love that redeemeth a soul. If you remember the son, the prodigal son, when he came, what he found, it was real love. Even though the Bible did not give what happened after, we can safely assume he didn't go out again. Are you know what I'm saying? When he came back, we can safely assume he didn't go back again in his uh, 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 ways. Hallelujah. Because when he arrived, he did not find somebody that was so, so, and so, but he find a father that was still looking for him. It's like, Professor, Ernest, thank you. finish as I was talking with the man <clears throat> yesterday I was telling how I went through jail and my life went through how I wanted to do it this way and God hit me with a jackhammer and finally <laughs> I went that way and then as I was talking his mouth was dropping jaw dropping for two reasons he went through the same thing. And then when I was saying this, he said, ah, it happened to me. <laughs> he went through the same thing. And then he said, all these years, 20 years, he thought he went through hell. But for me, made him be at peace. <laughs> that... Because he went through this, but he didn't end up in jail. He said, you're sorry. Makes me real life. for me it's good. <laughs> so to say that uh, whatever you go through, somebody, hallelujah, has went through it and is going greater than what you go through. 
That's why the word of God reminds us that do not be dismayed by the fiery trial that falls upon you. Amen. Do not. Why is that not to the neighbor, but it is in your house? Hallelujah. If the neighbor is a wicked one, he should not be there that the fire should fall. But why would you want, and you know, you're the one doing the work of, you know, the work of God and then it's in your, you know, how the fire falls. You feel what I'm saying? But it says, do not be dismayed. Tell to yourself, I will not be dismayed by the fiery trials that I go through. I will not be dismayed by the fiery trials that I go through. when I was speaking with that man we spoke about many things but it was interesting to see that while ministering to him the law was ministering to me hallelujah it was truly, greatly interesting to see it. Now, I see the heart of David. His son betrayed him. Hallelujah. But he cried for the death of his son. Instead of being <sighs> one problem gone, <laughs> he cried for the death of his son who were looking to kill him. How do you explain this if it's not the love of Christ, of God? Hallelujah. Trust, even as I do, there is power in the love of God. There is as much power in the word as much as it is in the love of God. For we were still sinners when he still decided to love us and to break the power of sin. Hallelujah. Trust there is power in the love of God. You know, sometimes I talk about my wife And sometimes she will tell me, God gave you a wife so you will be patient. <laughs> because I can tell you I was not patient. If I say this has to be done, it means it has to be done. When? Now. <laughs> I was so at speed that it was inconceivable for me to see a sloth running around. I, I will watch that movie. Uh, you know this lot. <laughs> no, you see what I'm saying. Zootopia. But one day, I was, I was praying. I said, Lord, please, help my wife. You know, help my wife. I don't understand this one. The way our brain was wrong. <laughs> and the Lord did like, a, uh, uh, like, like to, to, uh, to Abraham. 
<laughs> you think you come with a case. You, you're like, this one, I am right. And the Lord said, mm, you're wrong. I said, ah. And, you know, what I want to, wanted her to do, the Lord said, you yourself do it. <laughs> I said, oh, Lord, I'm not the one doing it. She's the one doing it. <laughs> yes, do it. So, I, what I say? The cousin in my bush. <laughs> How is it right? Yeah, I zip <laughs> my mouth. And I start doing the very thing we wet when I see my blood boil. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I'm a person. I I I, I love cleanness. My, my, my cleanliness is my holiness. Remember that? <laughs> No, I love cleanliness. But that's why the Lord had the church here. That's what that's the reason for to break me. Because two things is that my home must be clean. You don't mess up. And the second, <laughs> I never been in the church in the house. Never. When they say church, I see the big cross and the big building. If somebody would have invited me to set a church in the house, I will never go. I tell you the truth. When you follow God, but you are religious, that's what God does. So he's saying, I remember when we came here, we built the house. We had plan. Over here, I will do a, uh, a family room. And over there, a jacuzzi for my wife with uh, flowing water. <laughs> and over there was to do a reception room. I had all my plan. And now we were going outside looking for a building for, for the church. And as we were looking for the building for the church, one morning the Lord says, start in your home. But you see, the day it says start in your home, it was not like this. It has, what you see over here, that's, that's, the, that's the palace. <laughs> because when it says start in your home, if you saw the place, even the manger of Jesus was better. <laughs> it was horrible. At the look of it, it was horrible. But it says start there. So he broke me into understanding that his church is wherever two or three are gathered together. So I got the lesson. And then, through the process of patience, a man of God came to me. He says, I need you to pastor. I said, no, I am a prophet. I'm not a pastor. He said, I need you to pastor the church. I used to be in the church in, uh, what was that? German town. He said, no, I want you to pastor the church. So I will, uh, I said, uh, pastor, pastor thing, I'm not inside. Because prophet is easy. See what I'm saying? Prophet, you give the word, the person like it, the person doesn't like it, you, it's not your problem. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But pastor, you have to deal with the attitude of people. You have to deal with the behavior. You have to, Jesus. That was, that was not me. And then worse, you have to talk. <laughs> I used to go with my wife to do evangelists. When we go, I'm behind. And I said, go talk, talk. <laughs> She said, but how would you do when you... I said, I said no, I, 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 I love to be prophet. I hear God, thus hear the Lord, thou shalt die. <laughs> and then I'm done. But the Lord has to teach me. And now I see that he has implanted those different gifts. I see that the Lord, when he calls us, 
he does not only wants to make you operate in one direction the fivefold ministry can be embedded in you so that you operate it because there are some of the call that we receive we are comfortable in that call you know what i'm saying but god when he wants to move you to another part he will cause you to do huh, and anyway So he trained me to be patient. You know, you know the type of patient when somebody insults you and you're like, I'm Christian. No, no, that's not that patient. <laughs> it's the type of patient when somebody insults you and you say, Lord, what, what should I do? do I have to end all this? But yesterday, after speaking with that brother, he said, when you apply the word of God, you do right. But with the eyes and the lens of the love with which you apply, it helps the person receive that love. Hallelujah. You do not want to be only holy. Amen. You are to love as Christ loved. Before you apply the word of God, does it anger you that the person is a sinner or does it sudden you like I said not sudden uh, no 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 compassion come on that, that, that's you what yeah you have to have compassion in your heart hallelujah for the sinner before you have the word of God on him or on her I don't know if the brother will come. I pray that he comes one Sunday to, to fellowship. But truly, God has ministered done to me. You can love God truly deeply and be wrong. Acts to Apostle who? Paul. No, Paul. It is by love to God that he persecuted the church. For Peter, <laughs> he has a problem with what? Hypocrisy. Hallelujah. The Bible says when he sees the, the Gentiles and the, the Jew were not around. Hey, brother! Oh, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. When, when the Jew come around, they see him. Hey, brother! Who is he calling? <laughs> Hallelujah. But you know, this is something that is very venom Because if you smile... To a brother, to a sister, but you have a thought that you have not resolved with your brother and sister, you are in sin. You feel what I'm saying? Because the word of God says, if you have something against your brother, do what? Huh? And then, hallelujah. So, loving is definitely not just. You know, it's not just loving the word of God. It's how you apply that word. So that the love and the power of that love cause the person to whom you apply the truth 
to receive it and to be made whole. That's the whole purpose. Hallelujah. The purpose is the whole thing. And I pray that this will be even more in us. One time I was riding with my wife and she said something I was not happy about it. Uh, I mean, I was not happy at all. And we came home and I opened the word and as I'm studying, I fall on the verse which I knew, but I forgot. He <laughs> says, husband, be ye what? Remember? Be ye what? Be ye gentle with your wives. Loving your wife is one thing. Being gentle is another thing. <laughs> Somebody put this hey, hey. Be gentle to your wives. Do not be harsh. What is harsh? But I told you, I told you. Hallelujah. <laughs> 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 It's a sin. No, this one I told you I don't like it. It's a sin. Actually, in the book of Proverbs, it says, A gentle answer finish the strife. Hallelujah. You are in a strife with somebody, and the person rise. You, you rise, strife will continue rising. So when I saw that word, <laughs> lead by example. Hallelujah. Lead by example. The word of God for us is what is our authority to correct us in righteousness. Hallelujah. To lead us in righteousness. When you find that the word of God has exposed your behavior, what you do? What you do? You repent and then you go in righteousness. You found it? Colossians 3. Chapter 3 of Colossians. It says, verse 18. The Christian family. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Huh? Yeah, he's being gentle. Another version is also gentle. Can you give me the other version? Do not be harsh unto them. Take the amplified version. Yeah, pull the amplifier. But I, I can tell you one thing is that when you follow Christ, because of your desire to see the word of God be established, sometimes. You can easily apply harshness in righteousness. Thank you. It says, I'm going to read here. So it says, wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husband, love your wife. So that's the first thing. Be affectionate and sympathetic with them. And, hallelujah, do not be what? Harsh or bitter or resentful towards them. Now, in my case, when my wife did something, honestly, it was not right. I was not happy about it. But, instead of going to the word of God and pull Wives, submit to your husband. You know, this is easy. 
This one is easy. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm right. She's wrong. So it's easy to go to say you're wrong. You know what I'm saying? It was really easy. But in a way I express the wrong she did, I became wrong. So I go to the word. I study. I sit down. And the first thing I see is why to be to your own husband. I say, eh, 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 eh. <laughs> and then I look under, do not be ash. I say, ah. <laughs> so I call my children. I call my wife. We sit down, and I say, oh, okay, today we're gonna to teach you on how a husband has to love his wife. <laughs> <laughs> and the kids were all jumping they were shouting they were so glad they said oh wow 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 and I say so I skipped the verse 18 and I went to the verse 19 and I say and the word of God says husband do not be harsh unto your wife today daddy has not been gentle unto mommy I sin forgive me and Abby goes, can the pastor sin? <laughs> Hallelujah. But you see, if you can show your children how the word of God rules you, they will believe the word of God. Hallelujah. And for that reason, you know, we are we are more aware of our children and for the sake of it we are even more making sure that we we behave correctly because i realize that children can pick up on your attitude very very quick since it is a what we call a peer 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 you know human being that's how they do human being copy attitude i remember when i was younger I will see people preach. And then the way they talk, I will, I will talk like that. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So I realized that, uh, yes, indeed, human beings, we copy things. But when we start copying the ways of the Lord, and then we can show to others, like Paul said, he says, Timothy, follow me as I follow Christ. So, you become capable of telling, not just do this, but I do what I tell you to do. I love my wife. Oh, I love, I love my wife. Tell your wife you love her. <laughs> hey, hey, she said, I love him. Hey, I said, she said. <laughs> Myself, I'm up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, look at her. No, no, she said, I love you. <laughs> Baby, I love you. Hey, look at her. Hey, you look at baby. Is that the baby? Come, Isabel. Evangelist, look, go to your, your, look, look, look at her, look, look at her, she's like, <laughs> you know, I remember one, one time we were making pictures, and I told her to minister, I said, put your hand on the chest of your husband and look at him with love, she's like, <laughs> I said, I said, you need some deliverance. <laughs> you had a picture. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but you know, the beauty of it is when you submit yourself unto Christ, then all your reasoning, all your uh, your preferences they just vanish because at that point you know you are pleasing and seeking to please Christ 
Because you cannot please Christ and do the contrary. You know what I'm saying? Or what pleases him. My kids. If they do something that is not right, when I say, Abby, she's like, let the uh, Lord Jesus take me home. <laughs> just, just take me home. There you go. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> you see the picture? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One time that boy did something I told him not to do. And then when he does something wrong, I hold his ear. I say, you see, you have to listen. You have to understand. He doesn't like it. So that day he did something wrong and then he came. But his uh, collar was flipped over. So I was trying to hold the collar to put it back. But when my hand went over somewhere here, he <laughs> was like, yeah! I said, no, I'm, I'm trying to do your collar. I'm not trying to pull you on your ear. Love your children. Love your wife. Love your husband. I mean, you're not married, but you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's why I say, you cannot, you cannot, listen. If you date somebody, then you know you are not in the will of God. You're trying to to see if this is the thing you want is wrong because you're wasting time with somebody if you want a wife you go before Christ who is a giver of the favor you know what I'm saying because some wives you date them they put eyelashes they put wig you have dated the wig. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The day she come in your home, you are married. Now you go, you say, ah, it's the honeymoon. You arrive. When she jump on the bed, the wig flew like a black. You say, I divorced. <laughs> you did not tell me the day I was... A... That's why I said... To truly, for especially those of you who are single, to truly listen to hear from the Lord, who is your wife, because and then wives, who is your husband, because the day you see her and you see him, that knowledge, amen, is not a date; it's a knowledge. That this is my husband. This is my wife. And then you are already at that time setting up the will of God in your life. That's what I'm saying. So you are not working to see if we're going to work. That's a danger. This is a danger. And oftentimes, when you walk in that path, your prayer becomes emotional. Because when you pray, you hear yourself. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That's why it is important to hear before you step in. It's important. To hear before you step in. I thank God for my wife. If I did not hear that she was the one, <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, when she was younger, she was uh, mocking a grandma. You know why? 
because a grandma has what we call a double chin. You know the double chin what it is? <laughs> she did not know that she was doing something wrong. So a double chin is that you have one here, one here, and one here. And then she grew up. She was skinny, shapey, beautiful. And one day, after she gave birth, her belly was over here. <laughs> and she tried to put the penny, it's not, it's, it's, like, it's not going up. But now, me, the husband, I have to look at her, and it's two ways. It's either Allah, I say, you're beautiful, then you're seen. <laughs> yeah. Because... If I tell you you're beautiful, when you know what I'm thinking, is that man I'm sinning? So either I lie or I be quiet because I don't want to hurt her. But you see, I thank God because some of us we went through the unnecessary, the uh, unnecessary trouble of life. And I am among the statistics. So I know there is a path that leads to death. Hallelujah. So this time around, I say I'm going to choose the path of life. I will not put my eyes on nobody until God has spoken to me. And then the guy of yesterday, he asked me, he said, when you saw your wife, like, was she beautiful? Did you like her? I said, I saw her 80 years from now. When she would be having all a year I see here, a hair, white, a skin, uh, fatigue, fatigue, twisted, uh, wrinkled. I said, I saw her 80 years from now, literally. So, the day I saw her, the way she was dressed, it's like a, somebody coming from the, the field. <laughs> because he was dressed with a, a big, uh, what is that? No, no, not gown. Skirt. A weird skirt that was like a bizarre color inside. It was not even a, a normal color. <laughs> it was a cascade of bizarre color. And yet, she's a lady who has been in her life very sharp, clean, very well put together. But that day, I don't know what happened. She came braka braka. <laughs> Hallelujah. But since the Lord told me that was your wife, I was able to see through. You know, I usually say something. That day she was fasting. You know, when you fast, sometimes your breath can speak tongues. You know what I'm saying? So since she was fasting, she had that breath. So we sat down. And when she opened her mouth, I was like, no, for real. For, for, for real. For real. You know, some people, they sit next to you. When they say, brother, ah! yes. <laughs> you don't know what to do, but you dare. Yeah, you see, even the child is uh, he's laughing. <laughs> 
Baby, come. Come. Look at my miss. I did not say children come. What's your problem? <laughs> you go. <laughs> you know the children in, in home. When I call my wife, they go around. Baby, daddy call you. <laughs> you know, if you know her, she took some weight. But the way she took. It's like, yeah, there is more flesh on it. Hallelujah. And then, a rings, she could not wear a rings because a finger also, I was at it. You know, we're too big now. And she could not wear a ring no more. But I was, I was fine. It's not a problem for me. But I did not know she had that desire to wear a ring. That's what I'm saying. And sometimes she would tell me we have to enlarge the ring. And I would say, okay, 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 okay. Um, yeah. But you see, her being a wife, she was having something in her mind. Me being a husband, I did not see, see it the same way. You see what I'm saying? For me, it's not a big deal. For her, it's a whole deal. So now, the Lord has to reveal to me. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. He has to reveal to me that what was not a big deal for me was a whole joy. So I saw, okay, I went in Walmart. I was going in. And I said, okay, I'm going to grab her a ring. So, but to my surprise, the first ring I grabbed for her we were looking, uh, she was on the car. And then I called her and I was showing her. From all the price, she said, no, even the one that is $8 is fine. I was like, what? I don't mind, I can pay you the 100 the 500 the whatever. She said, no, 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 I just want a ring. Is, she you should not take something too expensive, it's fine. I already have my ring. But you see, God is good. And as she said that, I was thinking, I was like, so the lady who was helping me find the rings, I grabbed the $8. When I got the $8 rings, the lady looked at me. I said, it's not me. It's my wife who said that to have it. Before that, I bought for her a $2,000 ring. I started explaining myself. <laughs> uh, because... That day, I was having my thing of pastor. So she's like, yeah, look at this pastor. He came over here to buy an $8 ring with all the offering that the church gives. I said, you don't understand. Before that, I bought. So I, I, I started explaining myself. Why? Because I knew I was guilty. Even if she said, take the $8 ring, you yourself, can you take it? $8 ring to give it to your wife? Yeah. So I called my wife. And my wife says, yes, yes, yes. The lady looked. That's suspicious. <laughs> so I took that ring. She wore it. But my soul was not at peace. And I started hearing David. I will not buy. I, I will not to the Lord something that did not cost me. Hallelujah. Because he loves uh, his, 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 his love God. So I love my wife. So I said, you know, I need to do more than that. So by the grace of God, I find those rings online. Gold, diamond. <laughs> and then they slice the price 70% off. You see, if I did not hear how God was speaking in order to please him more and please her more, that opportunity, I would have missed it 
and I would not have created the momentum. Are you following what I'm saying? But God looked at all both cases and he gave a higher value to the lower one. So I bought it. When I bought it, I remember I came, we were having a, a Wednesday, Wednesday share. And I said, Grace, please take some uh, video. So I came, I gave her the ring. I, you know, I, I, I like to tell her, do you want to marry me again? <laughs> <laughs> so I gave her the ring and uh, I saw her, she was all, can you, a black woman who's red. Normally it's white who get red. But when a black woman become red, it means that's, that's <laughs> that, is, that the blood has boiled. <laughs> but for some reason, the ring was not the right size. It was, it was the size, but it was too, too tight, too right. <clears throat> I was not happy about it. So I called the people, I mean, I read, wrote into the people, and they say, okay, the time they receive the ring back and they enlarge it, yada, 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 it's gonna take two weeks. I'm like, mm -mm. I'm gonna buy another size. And then I will return the other size. So while the other size is going, the other one will already come. I am gonna wait for two weeks more. Because I saw that when we had to return it, you know, but this is what God did. I go to buy the second ring and it is 10 times cheaper than the first one. <laughs> the same exact one because that size, people don't buy it a lot. So the first size that I took was the highest price. But the second size, some people don't buy it a lot, they have reduced it. Now I was able to get her the ring. <laughs> now she she goes around and she does like that. She says, can you give me the plate over there? <laughs> um, Abby, did you see my phone? <laughs> and, and then she says, uh, a friend at work that we tell her, are you trying to show me, show, show us your ring? And she said, oh, do you see it? <laughs> this is what I'm saying. Now you see, for those of you who know, after going through the loss of Uriah, just a ring put a smile on her face. Hallelujah. So there is no problem in no family that is complicated, that cannot be solved. There is no trial in no family that is complicated, that cannot be returned, if only the step is made. Hallelujah. There is no problem. There is, there is nothing. I love you. <laughs> okay, have a seat. Hallelujah.